to uh, hold on to your touchstone as we uh, consider the uh, gospel this morning. On this third Sunday of Advent, uh, Bryce and Lauren and Nora and Hazel lit the pink candle. And the pink candle, uh, candle symbolizes joy. And we hear, uh, as Mary and Reggie, one of the most joyful passages in all of the New Testament. It's found in Paul's letter to the Philippians. And Paul's words proclaim joy. Just listen uh, or read. Uh, on the screens. Rejoice in the Lord always. Do not worry about anything. That's a great piece of advice. Uh, and experience the peace that passes understanding. Great words. I mean, these words flow in and out of our conscious thought. They're wonderful words to hear, but our minds aren't especially aware of the real life situation that Paul was experiencing when he penned these words that are so inspiring and beautiful. Paul was in prison, you see. A prison that was probably deep in the ground, a prison that was dark and dungy. And Paul was facing this day in and day out. And Paul's church in Philippi was experiencing threats from the outside and also some doctrinal and belief issues from the inside because you see Paul was Jewish as the first Christians were Jewish and Paul was now in a Gentile world in Philippi and people coming into the church were of Gentile background. Things were not at all for Paul and his congregation. They were both troubled. And this congregation in Philippi was very dear to Paul. It's called a friendship letter. Its words are very uplifting. But Paul is concerned about the division in the church because of what the people believe. And everything just isn't rosy and joyful. Christmas approaches us. Christmas, again, so quickly. And the voices around us tell us to be joyful. After all, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Isn't it? Isn't it? But, this is real life. Real life, and not all of us here in the pews today have reason to rejoice. Paul has this connection, <coughs> joyful connection to Jesus Christ, even though Paul never personally met Jesus. Paul had this mystical experience of where he writes in his letters that he experienced the resurrected Jesus. And this experience was so mystical that it changed Paul's life and his direction in life forever. And Paul became one who was persecuting followers of Jesus Christ and became one of the greatest proponents of the way of Jesus Christ we've ever known. Paul's life isn't joyful. It's not. Paul's life isn't easy, but Paul's life is joyful. Forgive me. Paul's life is joyful because Paul is committed and devoted to a purpose now, and that purpose is following the way or the path of Jesus Christ. And Paul powerfully exhorts his Philippian friends to be joyful in the face of all the difficult challenges that they have in life and as members of this early church in Philippi. And that's the message that comes to us this morning. Joy. 
There is an old saying that joy is not found in things. Joy is found in us. The Benedictine sister and renowned author of uh, many, many books, Joan Chittister writes this. Learning what makes us happy is the task of a lifetime. We scatter ourselves looking for pleasure, going here, tasting this, wanting that, getting that. But pleasure is fleeting and can only be maintained for as long as we can physically tolerate what it takes to get it. Once pleasure, it's necessary then to ratchet up the end, to do more of what satisfies us in the first place. And so we drink more, or we gamble more, and we lose more, or we eat more until eating itself is our problem, or we play more, we run more, or we buy more, until all of the joy runs out. And then pleasure doesn't work for us anymore. And the more self-centered we become, the less we have to make us happy. We have made ourselves the love of our lives and found little to adore at the altar of our egos. We have made ourselves our own gods. And we have forgotten God in the process. Wise words, John. Christmas approaches. Where is our joy? This Sunday in Advent, we link the, the uh, sense of touch with the theme of joy. Now, I've got in my pockets two other touchstones. One is a fidget. Uh, of a person that I met four or five times and who committed suicide and who left me. And I'm wearing another touchstone, it's a cross that was given to a person by a group of people who thought he would not make it through the night. Where is our joy? Where? And the question that we want you to spend some time with is whose touch or hands have lifted you up to discover your potential in life? At the age of 19 months, Helen Keller, who was born in 1880, became deaf and blind as a result of an unknown illness. And she had to experience life with only three of the five senses. She was blind and deaf, so all she had was her sense of touch and taste and smell. When Helen Keller was seven years old, she met Annie Sullivan. And Annie entered her life as a teacher. And Annie's success with Helen Keller is a remarkable story. Because she began teaching Helen Keller, this blind and deaf girl who was so shut out from the outside world, and, and, and taught her, manually signing into her hand the only way to communicate with Helen. And Helen quickly learned to form letters, but she didn't know that she was spelling a word, or she didn't even know that words existed. And one day, Anne sought to resolve her confusion. with the words mug and milk and the verb drink. So Anne led Helen Keller by the hand and she took her to the water pump outside and she put Helen's hand under the water spout. And as the cool water gushed over Helen's hand, it started to make sense in Helen's mind. And she knew that water suddenly meant this cool substance that flowed over her hand and quickly Helen 
fell to the ground and she put her face on the ground and she touched the earth and she demanded and to teach her the name of earth. And by nightfall, Ellen Keller had learned 30 words. And she began to learn and she ended up being one of our greatest spokespeople for the deaf community and she wrote books. And she's an inspiration to us all. Whose touch has lifted you up to discover your meaning and purpose and your full potential in life? Whose touch has enabled you to discover this wonderful, amazing world around you and given you new direction in life? The New Testament is just full of stories about Jesus touching and lifting people up. He took children in his arms and he laid hands on them and he blessed them. And when he often healed people, he would take them by the hand and he would lead them. Or he would touch their head or their eyes. He grasped the hand of Peter who had jumped out of the boat to follow Christ and was sinking in the Sea of Galilee and lifted him up out of the water. And Jesus gently cleansed the feet of his disciples on the night of the Last Supper before his own death. And he rubbed and he touched the disciples and he taught them about love and service. Jesus understood that we are all connected. And the same blood flows through all of our veins. And that we all hurt. And that we all have hope, and we all dream, and we all laugh and cry. And we are all children of God, all of us, in this amazing world. In his last Sunday morning sermon at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., Martin Luther King Jr. said, For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you are not what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. And so joy, church, comes when we realize that it's really not all about us. That Christmas really isn't about us. But Christmas it's about living our lives so immersed in the will of God that we become the hand and the touch that will lift someone up. We invite you this morning to become a part of a movement that seeks to proclaim wholeness in a world that in many ways is broken and needs to be transformed. Be a part of the movement. We invite you. Let us see.